Good evening. Glad to see y'all tonight. Glad to welcome. We already got people joining us on Facebook. That's great. Glad you're with us this evening uh, in our Bible study. Before we get into our Bible study, I just want to mention a couple things for prayer. Um, I want to. I got the update on my aunt and uncle, my, my aunt Sandra and uncle Jack. You know, my dad's brother's wife. Uh, she does have lung cancer, uh, and they're going to do a PET scan to see if it's went to her lymph nodes. Uh, and then they're going to recommend what kind of treatment they're going to do and everything. So be praying for my aunt Sandra, my uncle Jack, about that. Uh, Jolie's uh, procedures went well today, so continue praying for her. She's home. Miss Vicky's surgery went well. Um, the doctor seems to think it's not uh, cancer, but they're testing it. So be praying for her. She's still in the hospital. Miss Laverne's surgery is tomorrow, back surgery. So be praying for Sister Laverne tomorrow when she's having surgery, okay? Um, all those on the prayer list we want to pray for, and those who are sick, those who are grieving, and all the other requests on there, all right? Take your Bibles and open to the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 3. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 3. We're going to finish the section that I titled, Paul's Concern for Their Faith. They're referring to the Christians in Thessalonica. And we begin looking at this in verse 1 of chapter 3, and it goes all the way to verse 10. And again, I'm going to read that text, verses 1 through 10 tonight, and we will look at verses 6, uh, six through uh, 10 to close us out tonight on this section. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. Let us hear from the word of the Lord this evening. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone, and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourself know that we are appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened, and you know. For this reason... When I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. But now we live... If you stand fast in the Lord, for what thanks we can we render to God for you for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Let's pray together. Father, thank you tonight for the public reading of the Holy Scriptures, and I thank you for this time of assembly. As we come and assemble together, we come in your name, Jesus come to bow before your presence, recognizing and acknowledging you are the one true and living God. You are our God and our creator and our maker, and we want to praise you tonight. Submit ourselves unto you, Lord, and seek you, Lord, tonight in the study of the scriptures. I thank you for everyone who's here, those who are watching. I pray, Father, that you would give us understanding in the word of God, and you would teach us your word and help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that you would help me tonight. God, I ask that you empty me of myself, fill me with the Holy Spirit, and God, speak through me into every heart and every life. God, use me to be able to expound upon your word accurately and rightly, Father, that you may be glorified and magnified in the teaching of your word. I pray, God, that you would draw hearts to you tonight, help people to look to you, Lord. Strengthen those on our prayer list. We lift those to you who are sick, asking for healing and strength. 
we want to especially uh, pray for Miss Vicki as she's recovering. May you just continue to bless her health and healing and recovery. And I pray, Father, that you would just help her be able to go home soon. Pray, God, for Jolie tonight. You help her to rest and sleep well, touch her, strengthen her body. We pray, God, for Miss Laverne as she goes to have surgery in the morning, that you'll be with her, give her peace of mind, her and Brother Jim both. Give them peace of mind, Lord, and be with her doctors as they perform this procedure. Lord, guide them and give them clarity of mind they need to do what they need to do. Help her, Lord, to come out of it well and recovery well, as Father, we pray. And Lord, we ask that you be with them and bless them. Be with my Aunt Sandra and Uncle Jack. I pray, God, for your touch upon them and your grace to be upon them, Lord. You strengthen them tonight. God, let them feel your presence, I pray. Minister to them through your spirit. And Lord, we pray for healing, if it's thy will in her body. We ask that you would give them the right direction, that the doctor give the right uh, direction and what to do. And God, they would know it's what you want them to do. And follow that, we pray. God, we pray for those grieving tonight that you bless them with peace and strength and comfort that only you can give. We thank you for that. We love you, Lord. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, Paul is, of course, an elder, an apostle, an elder in the church. He's a pastor who genuinely cares for God's people. We have seen this in our study here in 1 Thessalonians already, how he cares for the, those that he ministers to, and you can see that in the other epistles that he writes to the other churches uh, as well. He not only wants to preach the gospel in places where the gospel has never been preached, but he also wants to establish the new converts in those places in their faith. He wants to make sure they're strengthened and they're rooted and grounded in the doctrine so that they won't be easily swayed or turned away from the truth. Uh, and he didn't get to do that in Thessalonica because he was run out of town uh, before he was able to uh, do that. Uh, Timothy, he, he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to be able to establish them and encourage them uh, in the faith while he stayed in the city of Athens, Greece. He longed to know if their faith was genuine, and if they were steadfast in their new faith even while being rejected and persecuted by their own neighbors there in the city of Thessalonica. Timothy went there to encourage, to establish them in the faith, and Paul would not be at peace until he heard the report from Timothy. So that's where we are tonight. He gets the report, and this is what he's talking about verses 6 through 10, the report that Timothy brings back to him. And so we start out tonight with actually it's the fifth point of this section that we've been looking at about Paul's concern for their faith. And number five is how he delights in them now that he hears the word from Timothy. He is delighted to hear that they are steadfast in their faith. They are still following Christ. And they do uh, long to see him as like he longs to see them. But by the time Timothy gets back to Paul, Paul's not in Athens anymore. He's most likely in the city of Corinth now. Uh, this is where he writes this letter from. He writes the letter to the church of Thessalonica from the city of Corinth. He's in the city of Corinth for many years. Matter of fact, he stays there, I believe, longer than he does anywhere else in his uh, earthly ministry um, uh, where God has placed him. <clears throat> Timothy's report was good news. Verse 6 says, uh, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love. As a matter of fact, it, this was so encouraging to Paul, what Timothy told him, that he uses the same Greek word that is used to describe preaching the gospel, the good news. <laughs> That's how encouraged he is by the report. Uh, the word good news in the Greek means to announce good news, to evangelize, especially the gospel, to declare good tidings. And so this was good news to Paul's ears that these believers were steadfast in their faith and they loved Jesus and they loved him. It's always good news when they hear a fellow Christian that's growing in their faith with Christ and they're persevering if they're in the face of tribulation or persecution and they're persevering in the faith. Timothy gives in this verse a four-part report on the Thessalonian spiritual condition to Paul. The first part of this report on their spiritual condition is their faith was genuine. Their faith was genuine. Verse 6a again says, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith. So their faith was genuine. Their hearts were the good soil. 
Jesus told a parable about the seed and the sower, the seed and the soil, the four different kinds of soil. Remember that? And uh, these hearts of these Christians were good soil because when the seed was planted in their hearts, as Paul preached to them and taught them the gospel, the seed got into their hearts and it germinated and grew into a fruitful plan in their lives. And they, they uh, are still bearing that fruit as Paul uh, writes this letter to them. I want to read that parable tonight because I think it's, it, it, we need to hear it to understand what he's talking about when he says this is good news of your faith, that he's, it's their faith is genuine because their hearts were ready to receive the word of God. Matthew 13, I'm going to read Matthew's account of it. You can find it also in the, in the Gospel of Mark. I'm going to read Matthew's account, Matthew 13, verses 1 through 9, as Jesus gives the parable, and then the explanation of the parable in verses 18 through 23. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. Because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them out. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some 30. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Now down in verse 18 of that chapter, he gives the explanation of this parable. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. So this is the seed that was sown on the, that fell on the wayside. The wayside is the outer layer, outer uh, edges of the field. This hard packed ground where the Farmers are walking on. They don't plow that up. And so as the sower is scattering, it's broadcasting the seed, sowing the seed out, some of that seed is going to fall out there on that ground. It's not going to get in the ground. It's going to be laying on top of the ground. So what does birds do when they see seed laying on top of the ground? They come down and eat it, right? And so Jesus says the, uh, that seed falls on the hard heart. The soil is the four kinds of soils are four kinds of hearts that the Word of God is, comes to. And he said, immediately the wicked one, Satan, he snatches away that seed. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on the stony places, this is the ground that hadn't been plowed that good, and rock is still underneath the soil. Okay? So there's, you can see the dirt, but there's still rocks underneath that. These are stony places. This is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Remember the, in the story Jesus shared, when that seed fell on that ground where it was a stone underneath it, it would come up and the root would go down, but the root could only go so far because it hit rock. It couldn't go through the rock. And so as the plant comes up, it's not strong enough, the roots aren't strong enough to hold it and to nourish it like it needs to. And when the sun came up, came out, it withered away. And uh, that represents tribulation and persecution because of the word's sake. So that person didn't stick, didn't stay. Then the next one, the next soil, says now he receives seed among the thorns. These are weeds. He is, is he who hears the word and the cares of this world, that's the thorns, I mean, that's the weeds, yeah. And the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. What does weeds do to plants? They take away the nourishment from the plant. Right? That's what weeds do. They, they take away the nourishment from the plant so the plant can't prosper. That's why my mama would always, my daddy would always have us hoe in the garden in the summertime with that hoe, right? Getting those weeds out from around it, you know. Uh, so that kind of soil, the weeds are the cares of this life, and the deceitfulness of riches. People care more about this life than caring things about God. They hear the word of God. They receive the seed of the word of God. But their love is in the world. Their love is in this life. And so they don't last. They don't stay. They don't stick around either. And then finally, the last soil, Jesus calls it good ground. He received the seed on good ground. As he who hears the word, understands it, and indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. You notice out of those four soils, those four hearts, four kinds of people, only one 
produced fruit. Only one. And, and they produce different amounts of fruit. Right? Some produce a lot of fruit. Some produce a little bit of fruit. Some produce very little fruit, but they're producing fruit in their life. But that, what is that fruit bearing? Evidence that they are really genuinely born again. They're saved. They're Christians, right? So out of those four soils, there's only one that's a genuine Christian. The other three aren't. Okay, they've never been saved, never been born again. And so Paul, in writing this, he is so excited. He said, this is good news that I've heard from Timothy. Uh, good, he says, let me get to my verse. Good news of your faith. He's knowing that these had the heart of good ground. That the seed of the Word of God got in that ground and it was able to germinate and produce life in them. Amen? And now they're bearing fruit for the glory of God. You know, I, I personally pray often when I'm in my prayer time, in my praying, I pray for God to give us people whose hearts are good ground. So when I'm preaching and I'm broadcasting the seed, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm broadcasting the seed of the Word of God. I, I want it to fall on good ground. Amen? I want it to fall on good ground. I long to see each and every one of you in our church bearing fruit for the glory of God. Some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. I'm I am concerned, as Paul was, about the genuineness of your faith in Jesus Christ. You know, it can be so discouraging to see people not living for Jesus Christ and not bearing fruit. It's discouraging when you try to minister to people and you preach and you teach to them and you witness to them and you counsel with them and they're just not getting it. That's, that can be discouraging. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, at the end of that book, Paul writes this to that church. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? So he, he tells the church, you examine your heart to see if you really are truly saved. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, if you have been born again, there should be some evidence in the fact that you're li you are born again. You should be bearing some fruit for the glory of God. One of the evidences of being a genuine Christian is bearing the fruit of a Christian, fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, right? Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance, meekness. We should be bearing that fruit in our lives the glory of God. So, Timothy gives this report of, their, uh, of these Christians in Thessalonica, of their genuine faith. The next thing he tells Paul of, is of their authentic love for Jesus Christ. Look at verse 6b. Not only was it good news about their faith, but also it was good news about their love. Now, he's talking about their love for Jesus, their love for Christ. You cannot be a Christian if you don't love Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> it was good news to Paul to hear that they authentically, genuinely love Jesus Christ. He is their Lord and Savior and Master. It's also a clear evidence of genuine Christianity. Love for Christ is the motivator for us to be obedient to Jesus Christ. That's the motivator for our obedience is our love for Jesus Christ. Listen how Jesus explains that to us in the Gospel according to John chapter 14. First Verse 15 in chapter 14. Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Obey me. If you love me, obey me. Right? And then verse 21, he says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And in verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Verse 24, He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So over and over again, just in those short four verses, we can see a repetitive uh, thing that Jesus is saying is, If you love me, you will obey me. If you don't love me, you won't obey me. Right? So the evidence of a genuine Christian is obedience to the word of of God. Those who are born again love Jesus and they want to follow him. Paul is excited. This is good news to him that these Christians in Thessalonica want to follow Jesus because of their genuine love for him, for Christ. The third thing that Timothy reports about their spiritual condition is their continuous remembrance of Paul. Look at verse 6c. And that you always have good remembrance of us. Now notice I told you long before when we started 
I, uh, we started going through chapter 2, how Paul used these pronouns, plural pronouns, describing not only himself, but also Timothy and Silas, because those three went to Thessalonica together, if you remember. And so he's including those two with him in this passage as well. And so here he's saying that this is good news, that you always have good, good remembrance of us. Not just remembrance, but good remembrance, right? You have good memories of us. Because you remember when we started our study in chapter 2, Paul had to defend his conduct. You read chapter 2, that's what he's doing. As he writes this letter, he's defending his conduct and Timothy and Silas' conduct and how they behaved themselves while they were there in Thessalonica. Why? Because the Satan in the enemies of Paul, in those unbelieving Jews, and that mob of Gentiles they worked up against the church, they were making false accusations against Paul, Silas, and Timothy and trying to belittle their calling and trying to slander their name. So Paul tries to defend their character and their conduct. And so here he's, he's glad. It's good news that the Christians there are not listening to that slander. They're not listening to that negative critique that's lies. That they have good memories of Paul, Silas, and Timothy while they were there with them. It was good news to Paul that they had cherished memories of him. And they were still loyal to him among his enemies in Thessalonica. They held to the truth that Paul was a true apostle of Jesus Christ. And they was not swayed by these false accusations being made against him there in the city with the enemies of Paul. In 2 Timothy 1.15, Paul writing to Timothy says, This you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelius and Hermonides. These two he names. He marks them because they are probably leaders of these people who are coming against Paul and making false accusations against him. Paul had enemies everywhere he went. Everywhere he went, every town he went in, he had enemies because he preached the word. And when we preach the word, when we stand for Christ in this world, we're going to make enemies because Satan is our number one adversary and those who are in the world, they will be our enemies unless they turn to Christ. Now, we're not to try to make enemies. We're to go in love and preach the gospel and minister. But even in that, we're going to have enemies in this world. Paul knew that Satan would try and draw away these Thessalonian Christians from the truth, just as he had done in so many other places. Listen, I want to read you two examples of that. He writes the same concern to the church in Corinth. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 19 through 21. Again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, beloved, for your edification. For I fear, this is what Paul says, I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish, lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbiting, whispering, conceit, tumults, Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they have practiced. And if you read the letter of 1 Corinthians, you find out this church had a lot of problems. Paul had to confront a lot of sin in that church, and he rebuked that sin in that letter and called them to repentance. And then in his second letter to the, this same church, here in, verse, in chapter 12, he's getting to the end of the book, He's saying when he comes, he don't want to come. In a, he wants to come in a way uh, that's not coming to have to rebuke them again. They should be repentant of sin, right? This is what he's worried about, how Satan draws him away. And then he writes to the churches in the region of Galatia. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. And what happened in the churches in Galatia is Judaizers came in those churches and began to teach legalism. They were saying, yes, you can believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and Messiah, but you must also keep the law of Moses. So me and you have to be circumcised. Well, that's a lie. That's, you don't have to do that, right? That's not the gospel. And so Paul is saying, you, how can you be so foolish to be bewitched that's a term for witchcraft. That you've been deceived to believe a lie. Satan has done that. But here in this book, 
Paul is thrilled to hear from Timothy that the church in Thessalonica still trusted in Christ, still trusted Paul's teaching of Jesus Christ. And number four, the fourth part or point of this report of their spiritual condition was their longing to see Paul. Look at the bottom of verse 6. Greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Now once again he uses us and we. He's talking about him and Timothy and Silas. And so he says, Timothy has told me how you're longing to see us and we're longing to see you. You know in our study of this letter we've already seen Paul's great desire to want to go back there and see them. Look back up in chapter number 2 again in verse 17. The last three verses, or four verses, I'm sorry, of chapter 2. Look what Paul says. But we, brethren, we referring to Silas, Timothy, and Paul, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. You see how he wanted to see them? He longed to be with his brothers and sisters in Christ. He longed to be with those that he went there and preached the gospel. This was the first church in the city of Thessalonica. There was no Christians there at all when Paul got there except for Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And they went to the synagogue for three weeks in a row, three Sabbaths in a row, and preached the gospel of Jesus. And then went out into the cities and preached the gospel. People began to get saved. The church was born. So he longed to go back and be with his brothers and sisters and to grow them in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now Paul's encouraged with the good news that they have the same desire he got. They want to see him too. Amen? You know that, that's, all, that's good, ain't it, that you know that your brothers and sisters want to see you. Right? Yes. It'd be bad if you come to church and nobody wanted to see you. <laughs> it's good that we want to see each other. We want to be together. We want to assemble together. We want to, we want to see each other. And that's the way it should be. Because we, we have to live in this God-awful world. This world that hates Christ. That is getting worse and worse and worse every day. Getting darker and darker and darker every day. And as we stand for the light of Christ, and we are light of Christ in this world, it's good when you get around other people that's got the light of Christ too, after being in that darkness. Now he says in, uh, in verse 6, greatly desiring. They just were not desiring to see Paul, Silas, and Timothy. They were greatly desiring. That's translated from the Greek word epipatheo. It's uh, from the word patheo, which is part of the word epi and epitheo, which means to yearn. Even to dote upon. To intensely crave something. To have an intense craving. I'm that way about ice cream, I have to confess. <laughs> All right? I have an intense craving of ice cream. I'll be honest with you, I confess, I eat a small bowl just about every night after supper of ice cream. But I'm still keeping my figure, though. That's good, ain't it? I figure if I can do that, I can still have my bowl of ice cream. Amen? Linda's that way, too. <laughs> now, I intensely crave that. You know, i got to have that every, every, just about every night. But, but this, this is how they desired to be with these apostles, these leaders, is they desired to be, you know why? Not only because they were fellow Christians and they, were, and they loved the Lord and they could fellowship, because these were the men that led them to the Lord. These were the men that showed them the good news, that preached the gospel to them. These were the men that... that came and faced adversity, faced persecution, and still loved them enough to preach the gospel to them. And they were saved. They were free now. They were at liberty in Christ. They have eternal life. And so they wanted to see them again. They wanted to sit under their teaching again. It's a great desire, greatly desiring to see them. Paul was eager to regain his fellowship with them and was encouraged to hear they felt the same way. And even more so, you know, when we were shut down for so long last year because of the COVID, I was, this is how I was feeling about my church family. I was, you know, I'd come up and I'd do uh, sermons on Facebook Live and just me or Chris would come sometimes and run the sound for me back there recording uh, on the CD. And it'd just be him and I up here. And then sometimes he wouldn't be able to come and I'd be by myself, especially on uh, uh, Wednesdays. 
so when I was doing it in my office, you know, remember I was doing it at my office desk, Wednesday nights. And I was longing to see y'all instead of just looking at myself on the phone. <laughs> right? I was looking forward to see your faces. And I've said this before on Sundays. You know, it's good to see faces. And Easter Sunday was a blessing to be able to have service here on Easter Sunday since we didn't get to that last year. But, but I long, had a great desire and a craving to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm craving for us to get other things going again, like Awanas. I'm craving to get that going again in, in Children's Church and and uh, men's breakfast, I'm craving to get that going again, too. I miss that. Uh, things that we do for, uh, as we come together, I'm craving those things. You know, I was talking to uh, my dad today, this evening, before I came up here. He was getting ready for church, too. And, you know, he was talking about how, you know, his, their church is just like all the other churches. They haven't got 100% going yet, like all of us are. And, and he was talking about that. And, and I said, yeah, the devil knew what he was doing when he let COVID come into, when he brought COVID into this, he didn't let it, but he brought it into this country. That was Satan, because the churches were shut down in this country. And it has hurt, not just us as Christians, but it has hurt the world, because we weren't able to do ministry like all churches had been normally doing, right? And you always hurt our community right here in Taylor County. Because the churches haven't been coming together like we normally do. And I don't mean all of us together. I mean in the churches and doing ministry. So we got to get going again. We've got to. We've got to do that. Acts chapter 2 verse 42 tells us the first church. Verse 41 tells us 3,000 souls were saved the day of Pentecost. Then verse 42 says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. In the breaking of bread and in prayers, they continued steadfastly in the teaching of the doctrines, the word of God, and in fellowship with one another, even in meals and in praying together. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 tells us, listen to this church, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day? The coming of Jesus Christ. We should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We should assemble together. Come together. This is what the Bible's taught us to do and told us to do. And we need to be obedient to that and come together. John MacArthur writes in his commentary, Timothy's report was the source of the apostle's shift from anxiety to delight. In the midst of all his distress and affliction, all the persecution, pressures, and trials he was experiencing, Paul was comforted about the true saving faith of his children. End quote. Now, it's his spiritual children, of course, he's speaking of. You know, it devastated the Apostle Paul when a church was unfaithful or when they succumbed to sin and false teachers. That devastated his heart. It broke his heart. As it does any God fearing and God-loving pastor, preacher, missionary, anyone who's in ministry. It breaks your heart when you see Christians being succumbed to sin and are misled. 1 Corinthians 1.11, Paul writes this to the church in Corinth. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. 1 Corinthians 4, same book. Verses 10 through 16. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. We are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world and all scurrying of all things until now. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel, therefore I urge you, imitate me. He's telling them how he suffered just to get them the gospel, and how he was mistreated and defamed in this world. And yet he came and loved them and preached the gospel to them and sold his life unto them. He was in Corinth a long time. And yet, this is the church that had the most problems with sin. As you read the letter of 1 Corinthians, and it broke Paul's heart because of that. 
And then the second letter he writes to him, 2 Corinthians 2, 3 through 4, he says, I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in, in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Hear his heart. Hear Paul's heart. He says, I wrote with many tears. I'm in much affliction because my heart's broken. I grieve, he said, because you're in sin. You're not honoring Jesus Christ. You're being deceived. And he says, I want you to be in the right place. When I come, I want to come with joy, not with sorrow. Because he knew if he got there in person and they were still in sin, he was going to have to hold them accountable and rebuke the sin, call them to repentance. And so it broke his heart. So we see those four points there of the condition, the spiritual condition of them. As he delights in them. He continues with that delight in verse 7 and 8. He says, Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, notice, hear him say that again, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. Paul says, No matter the distress and affliction I faced when I was in Thessalonica, and he did, he was run out of town. He went to Athens. He was, he was not treated well there either. Now he's in Corinth. And he's writing, he says, But because of what the report I've got back from Timothy about your faith, I'm encouraged. I'm comforted. I'm strengthened. Amen? He gives him strength. And then in verse 8 he says, For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. The word stand fast in the Greek is a military term. It means... To hold your ground and don't retreat. That's what it means. Hold your position. Do not retreat. Right? This military. So he's saying, as Christians, he says, I'm encouraged and comforted. Why? Because you are holding your ground and not retreating in the Lord. And that's what all Christians are to do. We're to stand fast in Christ. We're to hold our ground for the glory of God. Whenever Paul saw believers not retreating, where they were standing fast and standing firm, he was delighted. But yet he still exhorted them to continue to their resolve. Look over it. Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians, the second letter he writes to this same church, in chapter 2, verse 13 through 17. Remember, he's writing this to the same church, the second letter. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which He called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. See that? He, he's told them, God has chosen you, and it's obvious God chose you, because when I came and preached, He called you and you were saved. But I want you to stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. So he's telling them, you hold fast to the traditions you were taught by us, whether it was by us telling you by mouth or the letter that I sent you. He's referring to the first letter that we're studying here on Wednesday nights, 1 Thessalonians. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace... Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Well, he was encouraged by this church, wasn't he? Amen. All right, let's go back to chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians. Let's see our sixth point of Paul's concern for their faith. In verse number 9 is his gratitude for them. That's our sixth point. His gratitude for them. Verse 9 says... For what thanks can we render to God for you for all the joy which we rejoice for your sake before our God? Paul recognizes that all thanks for their spiritual progress belongs to God. All glory goes to God. All honor goes to God. All praise goes to God, right? If not for God's saving grace, if not for the sealing of the Holy Spirit, if not for the sustaining power of God, they would not be able to endure these afflictions. No one would. But it's because of God that we endure and persevere. So Paul rejoiced 
in God. He rejoiced in the God of their salvation. And he rejoiced in, God, in, in how they served the Lord because of God's power at working in them and through them. And so his gratitude is to the Lord. And finally, number seven, the seventh point of this section on Paul's concern for their faith is his intercession for them. Intercession, of course, means to intercede or to, be, to stand on someone's behalf, to stand by someone, to pray for someone. Verse 10 now, this is a continuation of verse 9, of course, so it's part of the question that he starts there in verse 9. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Even though Paul was rejoicing in this report of their steadfast faith and longing to see him, he still realizes the need for prayerful intercession on their behalf. He knows their lives are not yet perfect, and his ministry among them is not yet complete. We never reach perfection here in this world. We reach perfection when we are in heaven. Amen? Now, positionally, we are in Christ when we are saved. We are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. We positionally, we are... Christ's righteousness is imputed to our account. Our sins have been imputed to Christ, laid upon Christ. And so we're clothed in the robe of righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so we're seen positionally as righteous in Christ Jesus our Lord. But we are progressively being sanctified, perfected in the, by the Spirit of God in Christ. And then one day we, we will be removed from the presence of sin when we are glorified, the last step of our salvation. So we're not yet perfected, but we are being perfected in Christ. So we always have room for what? Improvement, growth. We always have room for improvement. We always have room for growth in our faith. Peter exhorts the same thing in his second epistle. He writes, listen to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, warning, be, 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 beware, why? Lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. He's saying, there's a danger out there, Christian. You could be led away from your steadfastness. Not you can lose your salvation because you can't do that. But you can be led away from your steadfastness in Christ. And he says in verse 18, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace and knowledge of of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Peter writes that. So we're to grow in grace and knowledge of Christ, knowing Him and knowing the, how the Word expresses Him. Each and every Christian needs prayer. This is what he's doing. He's interceding. We need prayer. We need to be prayed for. As long as we live in this fallen world and in this fallen flesh, we need prayer. Amen. We need to be perfected in what is lacking in our faith. We must be growing. So I want to close with these questions. Are you growing in your faith? Can you look at your life and see your life over the past to now and see where you've grown in your faith? Are you being challenged by the Word of God? And listen, if you're in the Word, you're being challenged. If you're in the Word, you're going to be challenged. You're going to be stretched. Right? You're going to be stretched. Do you have a desire to grow in Christ, grow in your faith? Do you have a desire to do that? This is mine as your pastor. This is my desire for you. That you are growing in your faith. Amen? Because I want you to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for this opportunity we had to be together again in this place. We thank you for the Holy Scriptures and the word we've heard tonight. Help us, Lord, that we would have this same heart, the same devotion as these brothers and sisters did have in Thessalonica. This longing, this, this desire to want to grow and want to learn more about you and want to be found faithful. And help us have the heart of the Apostle Paul who loved you with all of his heart, 
and all of his life. Help us to do that, Lord. God, search us tonight. See if there be any wickedness in us, O oh God. Purge our hearts and help us, O oh God, that we confess our sins and repent. That we might be able, Lord, to grow in your grace and knowledge. That we might be able, Lord, to serve you in this world in power of the Holy Spirit for your glory. Increase our faith in you, I pray. And increase our fear of you, Lord. God, help us at Mount Pisgah Baptist Church. I pray you'd use us in this community. Get us, get us going again, Lord. God, give us people who have the soil of the good heart, the good soil, that would be broken and plowed up and ready for the seed of the Word of God, that it might germinate in their lives and bear much fruit for your glory and for your honor. Help our people to long for you and to love you and to follow you and to see the importance of a coming together on Sundays and Wednesdays to hear your word and to worship you in spirit and in truth. We love you and praise you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming tonight. <coughs>